I was involved with uh, assisting the drafting committee of the Plenary Council. And the stage at which I was working with, there were 495 responses that we were working through. And a lot of them sounded like that. There is so much truth telling with such value for us to listen to that I'm grateful that those words and those voices are still being heard. And I want to say thank you to all of you for these three days. Um, it's really, it's been such um, a special time for me to hear um, and to observe and to gather your insights um, that inform the work that I do. So what I want to do is reflect back to you some of the words that have travelled through these days and then provoke you with some questions. Wisdom. Clarity. Reality. We believe in you. We gave it to you. Reception. Vulnerable. The shape of the journey changes. Responding to the need we see. Joy. Family of faith. I look around and see my siblings in faith. Leadership. Partnerships, sense of, the church's reconciliation with women, storytelling. If our democracy can't handle an advisory group, then we have bigger problems. We all benefit. We are saying something about ourselves. Just touching on a couple of those words. Reality is one of those fascinating words that pops up in Pope Francis's documents and, and speech. He often says, reality is greater than ideas. And for someone like me who likes ideas and writing and communicating, it's a, it's a challenge. What are you talking about? And we just experienced it in these last two days. It's the deeper entering into the mystery. That's what reality is. We can't ever define synodality and stop after a few sentences. Each speaker added depth to our understanding. Each experience that we've heard speaks to the importance of this way of being. So if you're not satisfied with the definition of synodality, that is a good thing. We're still working it out. And it's one of those really deep things because it's who we are, who we're called to be, the way that we're called to be. And one of my, probably the favourite verse from scripture for me is when Jesus spoke to his disciples, not the 12, the disciples at the supper discourse in John and said, this is how others will know you, by the love you have for each other. I want to touch on the phrase, how does this transform the peripheries? And at some stage I looked up at the roof and I thought, 
that's more like the reality. I know it's a um, they're consistent shapes, but reality isn't them and us, the inside and the outside. It, it's interconnectedness, and the, that transforms the peripheries if we do it properly. If we recognise it, there are no edges. They're the people in our midst. It's those words of Dean, we all benefit. It takes away the condescension. The sense of, the sense of joy. What did you detect? What did you sense? Where was the spirit sense of listening, sense of mutual respect, of that common desire to learn and move forward. We call that the census for day. Sense of joy, sense of friendship. That's at the heart of consensus. As Shane said, it's not about voting and forcing some sort of outcome. If we're genuinely friends, we can disagree, but we can move forward together. And let's turn Dean's words around. He said, if our democracy can't handle an advisory group, then we have bigger problems. If our church can't handle, then we have bigger problems. What would you insert? <laughs> Seriously, we're not that fragile and we're starting to open up to conversations. Let's keep it going. So some questions. Where am I on the synodal journey? What blockages can I identify? And there'll be the external... I'm in this parish, I'm in this diocese, I have, have these issues that restrict me. What are my internal blockages? I think the Pope's convinced, and I'm quite convinced, that the greatest threat to synodality, to that movement of gathering us all, which I, I see him as trying to gather the whole church. This is why it's taking a while and moving together is that resistance. And it's not necessarily a militant resistance. Sometimes it is. It can be comfort. Why should I move? Who is not here at this conference? And I'm very grateful for those videos. And I've heard people say, it'd be nice to have more young people. I went to the session at Ashfield last night and I can say, don't worry about our young people. <laughs> the table I sat at had girls from two of the high schools and they were articulate, they were informed, they were very well experienced. I don't know how much theological study I'd done before I was able to tour a synagogue, a mosque, know the words interfaith and ecumenical dialogue. They were all familiar with that. They all agreed it's a good thing and they all agreed they were privileged to be in the Catholic education system so they had these experiences. And I immediately tweeted, it does a theologian's heart good <laughs> to experience this um, because they get it. And I imagine if we plop them down, even my own, own children, we plop them down in mass and say this is church, they will feel very restricted. They may not hear the words that are around them in their education system. And in many ways it's us that, that need to change, not our young people. They're ready. Um, one of them was uh, uh, the artwork that was up there was beautiful and it reminded me of the girl last night who doodled as we talked about um, the environment and climate change and she wrote down all the words she heard and linked them all together and it grew like a beautiful tree and she wrote above it in bigger words, Laudate Si, Pope Francis exclamation mark. 
<laughs> they've got the language. They've got the resources. God bless Catholic education. <laughs> Who else is not here? For me personally, I think of the renewal movements. Their space, they have found the space at, at the peripheries, as we say. So, so often the words we hear about people who are not in the pews on a Sunday is they've lost their faith. That is the key message going out there. And I hear it from from. From clergy's mouths, I hear it from grandmothers and mothers and, and, and so on. What a shame. These people have lost their faith. It's, it's more tragic than that. They love their faith. They want the community. And they've found some community. During COVID, where I didn't see a satisfactory response from the church, maybe you did, I hope so, to people who were so isolated, um, what did pop out in, in those gaps was the work of the renewal movements. They connected with the plenary council. They said, what's going on? Who's allowed to speak? What are they saying? What do we want them to say? And these conversations flourished. And I think there's great value in saying we appreciate that. We want to join the conversation. Um, whether it's so much as saying, hey, you come here and listen to us or we'll, we'll join your space, um, it's good to think about the connections, all of this that we've talked about in the past two days, the storytelling. And another group, who's not here? Um, I probably could ask for a show of hands how many theologians are here. One, two, there's two women over there. Three, I know Jared Moore was here yesterday. We are the body of Christ. We are called to be a sacrament of healing. This is, this is the time to live that. What does it mean? What does it look like? Why aren't our theologians, our liturgists, talking about this? Why aren't they shaping our response? Where is this ministry of healing within our own communities and as being a, a sacrament to the world, of course? Where is the music and the art that if, if words don't help, maybe it's music, that can help heal us and draw us together. I think the this, this spirit will, will raise something up and it's our duty here to respond to and encourage when that comes. So thank you. I'm taking a lot away with me and I'm very grateful for the honesty and um, the equity that we've had here. Um, and as a theologian, I'm at your service. If you want to contact me, if you want my email address, please do. Thank you. Uh, it's lovely to be standing up here, I can tell you. Um, yesterday I realised that um, I was a conference listener. I thought I was a conference participant. But uh, all of a sudden I speak to Peter Gates yesterday and um, he says, can I do this little gig here? Not knowing that it was straight after Melissa, so the pressure is on. But um, So I, I gathered a few thoughts this morning over a cup of coffee, basically, um, mistakenly not reading the program and seeing that um, it's why mission, why synodality, why truth-telling, why reconciliation. I was sort of thinking I'll just talk about what I've experienced, but maybe it's the same thing, Peter. Um, 
The, the thing I'd probably, the question I'd add to that list actually, why mission? Why synodality? Why truth telling? Why reconciliation? Is um, why me? And when Peter asked me actually to gather a few, you know, make up a bit of a word salad and um, speak for a few minutes, I said yes, but pretty much everything inside me was wanting to shout out no, you know. And as I've been reflecting on that, I think that's it's probably my personality and it maybe is a similar personality to people in the room. But um, I think it's been that tension between the word yes and the word no in ministry in, in an understanding of a journey of mission and how many times I've been in situations where I, I wonder how on earth did I find myself in this place and am I, am I the right person to, to be in this place? Um, and I won't bore you with anecdotes, but, um, you know, there's just so many s stories of um, being in privileged moments, like the number of people here who might have been part of the um, Return Mission Network that Larry Nema used to run in Melbourne. And I would go along feeling like an imposter. And, and uh, I had a conversation today, actually, where I won't name the person, but it's, not, it's no big deal, but I spoke to someone the other day about this and the first question that came out was well what was your place you know where did you go on mission and that's how I felt the whole time you know that these specialists of mission were had lived 10 20 years come back home and were broken really um, by the you know, juxtaposition of a culture they've left and a culture that they're re-entering and through the process of listening to their stories I kept asking myself what am I doing here you know uh, but really believe that we're all, as we all understand, we're all called to mission um, and we're all called to mission where we find ourselves planted and sometimes that's being planted alongside people who are um, in pain and sometimes the person who's in pain is also like myself in that situation. So... I think the question why me is is pertinent to this why reconciliation, why truth telling and so on. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I um, actually talking about why me, I, I went to a celebration of the 50th anniversary of a fellow who'd been, who is a deacon in the Blessed Sacrament community in Melbourne. That information alone for those people who are, Melbourne, who are from Melbourne, probably um, you'd know who I'm talking about. And... Um, I'm a classically trained musician and I sort of had a, a popular culture bypass from about the age of 13 until today, you know. So ask, ask me a question about, I don't know, Brahms, Tchaikovsky, Beethoven. I'll have a conversation with you. Ask me about, I don't know, Led Zeppelin or something like that. And I really would struggle. Um, so, so Google is my best friend in this situation. So I thought to myself, what, was, what were the songs of 1973? Because I wanted to write something to... I don't think you mind if I say his name's John, okay? And I wanted to write something to John in the card. I didn't want a card that had a crucifix or a dove, you know, or a Madonna and child or something like that. So I went to the birthday card section to the 50s, you know. I know it wasn't his birthday, so I thought if it's blank, it doesn't matter. So I got a blank 50 card. And the card, the front of the card said 50 rocks, you know. <laughs> I'll get that for John, you know. The song that I picked was by Chris Christopherson. I you know, don't know much about him. Um, but Chris Christopherson in 1973 sang a song and the song was Why Me? And I said to John, probably, I guess, in religious life, you've asked yourself that question time and time again. And in reflecting on that, I thought um, also I can put myself... I've worked for Catholic Mission now for almost 30 years. <clears throat> and people quite often say, how long have you been with Catholic Mission? Not Catholic Mission people because they know, but even here in over coffees and that. And I've recognised in myself being a bit... Um, you know, giving, a, giving, making an excuse for it, you know, and saying stuff like, oh, well, you know, I've had lots of different roles, so it's all been fresh and I stay around because I used to do this and now I'm doing this, you know. Um, and I realised that's a bit gutless, you know. I tried to um, make an excuse for hanging around for so long 
when really I should be saying that I understand myself living in vocation for mission. And I sort of don't say that. So here I am saying that here and probably challenging myself to say that in conversations with people about, well, how long have you been and why have you been there, you know, that long? So in the um, context of all that, to, to get back to what have I been listening to since I was told I should have been listening, um, I, I st started to think, well, this is not the, because I've been around the block a few times, it's not the first Mission One Heart conference, you know. So I started asking myself this morning, what's, what's been going on for me this time that's perhaps different to last time? So I just jotted down a few words. And I think the shift for me, um, and I can only speak about me, but I wonder and I hope whether it's a shift in my understanding of the church as well, but I've had the experience in past conferences of, I just wrote these few words down, of anger, frustration, disconnection, and not to be fully negative, I thought I'd better find some good goodies, you know. Um, so I thought also, you know, theological enrichment and joy. They've been the experiences of the past. And then I thought, well, what words would I use to try to encapsulate, you know, what's going on for me in these few days. And I put down two words, and one was emotion and the other one was hope. And um, there's been a lot of emotion for me in this conference. I'm not sure why, and it hasn't only been in this room, but it's been in really, really sacred and precious moments of, well, truth-telling, actually, sharing people's stories have been so, um, I felt so privileged and it's been such a sacred moment and I'll open up a few of those types of experiences but I found myself journeying in emotionally through this conference rather than intellectually and I think that's a really, um, for me, a really good move to move from head to heart because I think, I, I jotted down something here, yeah, did a little bit of Googling, you know, I jotted down, because um, I like John the 20th Pope, is he Pope Saint or Saint Pope, but um, John the 23rd, um, you know, it's quite important for me because I've done a bit of liberation theology and I really like um, the Vatican II stuff that, you know, kick-started some of the, um, you know, the response to that being preferential option for the poor and so on. Um, but I picked up this phrase, really liked it, precious, links in the chain of love, which I think you might have said on Vatican Radio or something like that. So precious links in the chain of love um, makes me think of sometimes the links uh, critically endangered, you know, to the point where maybe the, the link will break. And a couple of um, ways to illustrate this is getting back to those sacred moments. Um, I was privileged to facilitate one session, or two sessions, but the one I'm talking about now was repentance and something, but it was about uh, child, basically child abuse or sexual abuse um, within a church context. And um, there grew a realisation that the, the, the victim of this atrocity is much, much broader than the actual individual who has experienced the awfulness of it. So, you know, family members, um, colleagues. I, I used to teach with someone who was, is, was an abuser and is in jail. Um, we spoke to family members in the group who had personal experience. But also I think the church as a whole um, becomes a bit of a weak link when we don't try to heal that wound and just as trauma can take decades to surface and to be named, I think this trauma of sexual abuse um, can take us a long time before we feel like it's a strong link again. And I think we need to be brave enough to, to hold ourselves in that, in that pain. Um, another example is last night, again, not just in conference, but I suppose the whole conference is about the lunchtimes and the dinners afterwards and all that. Um, I had this beautiful conversation with two friends. And I really don't know why I get emotional about it, but 
they were sharing stories and I thought to myself, um, why is my pain, how can I uh, justify entering into this conversation when the pain of these two people is more than my pain? You know, I've felt so humbled by the story and the sharing of that. And tapping into mine, which is obviously where my emotions are coming from, but it sort of illustrates to me how we, getting back to the church being in pain, I think that this sharing of stories where we open ourselves to vulnerability is a really, really strong and healthy thing. And there are leaders in this space, and often I find the leaders are the ones who are themselves struggling through this process of healing. So how do we get from, you know, the system of a, an, an experience of suffering. So it moves from being victim to survivor, but then actually moving to be the most precious link in that chain of love, something really to hold dear and to hold sacred. Um, one of the things that I stood out for me in um, the many slides we were presented with was Sister Ilya Delio, and I shared this in one of my facilitations, but she said, um, let us liberate our minds to imagine a new world. And it jumped out, so I jotted it down. I thought, that's fantastic. Um, and the re one of the reasons why I liked it and one of the reasons why I've liked this conference is that I haven't actually been hearing the term kingdom of God very much. And we have heard it a lot, you know, and we use, we use it a lot. And I think we've, we use it to the point where it sort of doesn't connect with people very much. It doesn't mean what we think it means when we talk about it. Um, and yet this, I think, encapsulates the kingdom in a way that I can connect with and I reckon other people can connect with. Let us liberate our minds. So it's got that word liberate, which I really, really love. Let us liberate our minds to imagine a new world. In other words, the kingdom. So I think we need to be challenged as churchy people, and maybe our theologians can help us with this, to find language, you know, to find language that connects with people. Because it's in the connection that this link of love is becomes a reality. So the the imagined world creeps closer and closer to us you know we talk about people on the margins a lot and um the word margin i keep thinking in my primary school days when the teacher would say draw a margin you know? <laughs> and what you'd do is you'd have the i don't even know what the little left hand margin was for but we'd write on the right hand side of the page and there'd be a margin on the left um so the big part of the page was the page and the small part of the page was the margin but the marginalised people, they're on the big part of the page. Like the people who are suffering, the oppressed, the, you know, the homeless, the prisoners, the this, the that and the other thing, the, the you know, poverty around the world, these are taking up the space of the page. And white, middle-class me live in the skinny part of the page um, and I have power just by virtue of the fact of where I was born and how I live my life. And these people are powerless. So I really think that, you know, preferential option for the poor and moving into a space where we recognise that if we want to feel God's love, you know, we could certainly pray, you know, come God, be with me, some type of prayer, you know. But I think it was Tim who said, move to where the poor are and that's not moving to the skinny part of the page get out there where there is life to be lived certainly um challenge to face like you know a couple of um a couple of um rich experiences which have formed me uh some work in myanmar and some work in the philippines to see and to speak about villages now bombed where you know life was thriving and where hope was alive um to speak with family members who have had their um, son daughter husband wife shot in front of them as part of this crazy drug killing 
um, phase of the Philip of the Duterte um, regime. You know, all these things are. Uh, in Tim's, um, with Tim's, in Tim's words, uh, that's where you go and find God. We do mission in this big fat margin, you know, where God loves people, and that's how we experience love so much. So, you know, bums on seats in churches. Do I give a damn? Excuse me for the word, but do I? Um, I sort of don't really care too much about that, as much as I go to church a lot, you know. Um, just to finish, um, I said I was going to talk for five minutes, but um, <laughs> the other thing that I reckon is for me, drives me, is I think it was again John Paul, the, not John, John the 23rd, who said, well, we need a Vatican Council because we have to, answer, we have to come up with a way of saying your, thy kingdom come. I think that's what he said, something like that. And when I heard that in one of my liberation theology classes, you know, I thought, well, let's. Uh, I'll ask myself that question. You know, how do I say, "Thy kingdom come"? It made me think about how we all say, "Thy kingdom come." If I can just quickly say the other, "Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as." The words get lost. You know what I mean? And certainly the words "Thy kingdom come." So I thought, how when I pray, I can't do it in church because we all get you know, through on the conveyor belt of saying it. You know. But I, I say to myself, we need, a, we need a big chasm between the word kingdom and the word come. There needs to be space. There needs to be a space for us to liberate our minds. I'm not going to say build the kingdom, right? To liberate our minds and to imagine. In other words, we're co-creators in this space. We do some of the tilling of the soil in order for this kingdom to come. We, it's not a passive request of God to create for us, thanks God, you know, a kingdom. And I think we all understand that. But for me, I keep praying the kingdom come with a big, big gap between the two words. So just to finish, um, this business of why me sort of drives, I suppose, my sense of, you know, spirit and stuff. And I think this conference has been, you know, an opportunity for us all. So in thinking about why mission, why synodality, why truth-telling, why reconciliation. It, it is actually, you know, why me, why you, and why us. Thank you. Hi, all. My name is Quain. I come from the Diocese of Parramatta. My parents are immigrants from the Philippines. They moved here when I was one, and they made a home here in Western Sydney. I have the incredible privilege of standing before you because my parents made the incredible sacrifice to move here. Now, I grew up with my mum. Uh, she's quite devotional. Uh, with rosary being said every single night. And my brother and I would snicker away because we had no idea what was happening. But there was something about praying together that kept my family together. And when you move to a country where you don't really know anyone and you may not have the resources to thrive, family was what made it matter. And that's what made it work. I grew up in Catholic education. I had dreams when I was young of being an astronaut. I was interested in the wonders of the universe. I dreamt of being being a um, a DJ. My Filipino parents didn't like that idea. I also jumped to being a director because I really loved the idea of creating content that would move people. It was not until I moved to, uh, sorry, it's not until I first went to the Philippines after eight years of living in Australia and my parents constantly telling my brother and I how lucky and privileged and blessed we were 
that it finally hit me what that meant. Because when I went back, I encountered my family members in a very poor situation with them sleeping on cardboard boxes. And so at eight years old, all I ever wanted to do then after was to give a voice to people who didn't have a voice. And much to my parents, um, they're very happy about this decision. I decided that I wanted to become a lawyer. And so that's what I set my heart on. I didn't ever think that many years later, after going through studies, that I would then be invited by God to serve in youth ministry. To be honest, that doesn't make a lot of sense to people. But it makes a lot of sense to me because I had an encounter of Jesus Christ in a profound way at World Youth Day 2016 in Poland. And I can articulate that to you because I've had the privilege of community, of having a faith community that helps me articulate my faith in the world, that helps me connect the dots between what I understand about God's mercy and my lived reality and how I show up in the world as authentically as I am. To remove our sandals before the sacred ground of the Allah. That's how Pope Francis describes the art of accompaniment. Very much the theme that he has invited us to understand over the last couple of years, and particularly in youth ministry, with his synod with young people and his exaltation on Christus Vivit. It's accompaniment that we've been able to draw our young people in to understand synodality. How do we walk together? The last few days of this conference has been challenging. Yeah, challenging. And I think partly because there's much of who I am that's encountering attention with what I'm hearing and what is stirring. But I believe it's this tension where we are precisely being called to hold at this present time in our church. Over the past three days, I've met a number of you and I have stood in awe at the way in which God can bring so many different people together. It's always so crazy to me that God can do that because when you go to World Youth Day and there's millions of young people, I'm convinced there's only God who can do that. I have been challenged because I've been invited to respond to a new way of being in the church. Because I think about my family when they moved here, and I don't think church was when they, I don't think church is where we found community. It's in places where they were invited to connect. I'm being challenged because we are being asked to shift the way in which we receive. We talked a little bit about vulnerability and part of being vulnerable is also being open to receiving. And in a society that's so filled with us getting by on our own and kind of a competition reality that we live in where people thrive and hit milestones and post on Facebook when someone achieves something, we can almost be convinced that we don't need anyone, even ourselves who stand in privileged positions like we do. I 
and being challenged because we're being invited to have a willingness to be changed. So what have I learned here in the last three days? I was sharing to someone earlier that last year, when I was looking to 2023, the only things on my calendar, besides basketball, was World Youth Day and Youth Ministry. Then I was invited into uh, an office in the Chancery at the end of last year, where I was asked if I would be willing to lead a diocesan synod for the Diocese of Parramatta. So that changed my life a little bit. But I think synodality, at least what I'm learning about it, is a recognition that much of what we are called to do at the moment is to invite and to listen. And that's hard. Because many of us, and I think it's also the culture of social media and the news that tends to be quite divisive, pushes us into this mind frame that we need to fight to be heard. We're just constantly fighting to be heard. But synodality challenges us to listen. One of the things that I've been hearing over this last three months of trying to encourage our community at the Diocese of Parramatta to enter into a process of synodality, they talk about consultation fatigue. They're kind of over being consulted. And I get it. But I think part of the reason why it's tough is because we've been asked to listen more. And yes, of course, that's tiring. Because I think listening deeply is harder than speaking. So if I may, I'll just share one snippet of why I think synodality is actually being lived out right now, and the Spirit is doing what the Spirit does. On the first day, as I mentioned, I was challenged. There was a moment in the afternoon where I was moved to tears. I was really frustrated. And the whole time it was because I was listening and really fighting to listen. And that was going up against a lot of what I was, what I had understood about certain things. I was moved to tears by a deep passion and a desire to change the way in which we talk about our church, about our people and about what's been and what's to come. So after listening to a number of sessions, I noticed how those words hit my core, and I asked myself, is this really what mission is about? And then at one point, I thought, I don't want to stay here anymore. Sorry. And so I grabbed my backpack and um, a number of sessions, I decided I'm going to leave now and go do work. <laughs> but three times I was stopped and I was reminded of Simon Peter. The first time I was stopped by two of my colleagues who I work with in Catholic schools, Diocese of Parramatta, Marguerite and Daniel. They didn't do much. I just kind of walked by them. I said, Quain, are you okay? And I looked at them with this kind of look. I just said. (laughs) 
And it was an invitation to go for a walk with them and not to walk away. That helped me to come back. The second time, I was wandering the corridors upstairs and a colleague of mine that I serve with in the Ministry of the Lasallians, Phil, stopped me and asked me the same question. <laughs> Gosh, I don't hide my emotions well, do I? Hey, Quain, are you okay? I probably had a similar look. Do you want to go for a chat? No, 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 I don't want to keep you from, you know, the next thing that you have to do. No, no, all good. We'll just we'll go downstairs and we'll find a spot. He offered 30 minutes of his time to speak with me. Because as an extrovert, it's really hard for me to digest things and I need to speak it out. And he offered me the space. And then I came back. The third time, oh, Lord, I just, I wanted to head out. Probably made some excuse that I wanted to beat traffic back to Kellyville. But I had three of my colleagues in the mission enhancement team, Donnie, Allison, and Rachel, who noticed that I wasn't well and asked if I could, and asked if I would be willing to sit. So sorry again that I pulled them out of session four on, on the first day. But they found a little corner in that catering room and they let me cry. In, in my vulnerability, they showed me Christ's mercy. And I've always been struck by how Jesus came back with his wounds. They listened to me and they created the space. They offered me a sense of hope that God dwells with and within us. And as I sat with tears streaming, lamenting at my own frailty in not being able to hold my own suffering, a simple invitation offered me what the human heart often desires, to be seen when all wants to do is hide. So in my reflection today, it is one of gratitude and awe, and one of insight, I hope, into what is possible for us moving together as a church, one that is less about speaking, but more about listening, more about seeking the one lost sheep the two lost coins and the invitation to call people back. More about presence so that we can see one another and Christ in each other. For I am convinced in this process I have learned that to be heard is a privilege and to listen is to give and to listen is a gift. So thank you for the gift that you off you've offered me by listening to me and the stories that I bring with me of my family and the community that I get to serve. Thank you for removing your sandals and revealing Jesus to me, especially when I wanted to walk away. 
May we seek to do the same in our ordinary, in the hope that a desire to see Christ draws us closer to each other, and that witness of God's love can truly be seen as expansive and for all. Thank you.